Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile detail. Four children in your city have apparently been abandoned by their mother. There's no trace of the woman's whereabouts. There's a possibility of foul play. Your job, investigate. It was Friday, February 8th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from juvenile hall, and it was 7.46 p.m. when I got to 1335 Georgia Street, the office. Joe? Yeah, Irene? You talked to Captain Powers? Yeah. The way it looks, Frank's going to be tied up in court for a couple of days. It's going kind of hard. Game war, isn't it? Yeah. Seems like everybody in town's climbed on this one. Really making a big thing out of it. Uh-huh. Fellow Skipper said I was supposed to give you a hand on anything that might come up. Then you just made it. Hmm? Woman in the next office. You better talk to her. What's it about? It'll be better if you got it straight from her. Who is she, a crank? I don't think so. See what you can figure. All right. Mrs. Eggers? Yes, Miss Gardner. You ready to do something about this? Yes, ma'am. I'd like you to meet Sergeant Friday. Joe, this is Mrs. Eggers. Now, how do you do? Miss Eggers? Well, if you'd give him the story the way you told it to me. You bet I will. Sit down, young man. I'll tell you all about it. All right. I'll get your book out. I beg your pardon? Your book. You're going to take some notations, aren't you? Well, if you'll just tell us what this is all about. Yeah. Well, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. I'm not. It's just that I take an interest in the things that go on around me. Civil-minded is the way they put it in the papers. Uh-huh. Of course, there are people who say that I pay too much mind to their business, but it isn't true, not a bit of it. If you tell the sergeant what happened. Oh, yeah. Well, these people moved into the house about six months ago, the five of them. Yes, ma'am. Stevie, Pamela, Carol, Martin, and the mother, Rowena. Four kids and the mother. All right. Would you like to go on? Well, now, right off, I could spot this woman. I've seen a lot of them. Well, how do you mean that, Miss Eggers? You can make it crystal if it's any easier. Yes, ma'am. What did you mean, that you've seen a lot of them? Alkies, you know, drunks. Mm-hmm. Well, she's one. I could spot it right off. Her and those four beautiful children. Yeah. Well, the first few months they lived there, I'd maybe see her a couple times a week, you know, going in the house or coming out. Just a couple times a week. I see. Last week, ten days, I hadn't seen her at all. Not even a little sight. Mm-hmm. So right off, I figured that something was wrong. That's the way it looks to me. All right, thank you, Miss Eggers. We'll check on the house right away. Well, that's what I wanted this policewoman to do. I told her I'd go right along with you. Well, that won't be necessary. Now, listen, young man. If there's anything wrong with them kids, I want to know about it. I want to do my part. The whole neighborhood's talking. Is that right? Sure. Little Stevie's been to all the houses looking for something to do, asking for work. It just seems to me that there's something wrong about the whole caboodle of them. Not seeing the mother and the way the boy don't eat the lunch plate. Not seeing the other kids. There's something that don't fit over there. All right, ma'am. We'll look right into it. You just do that. We'll see what I say is true. Thank you, Mrs. Eggers. Don't go thanking me. Just trying to be civil-minded, that's all. Mm-hmm. Just seems that there isn't anybody who cares about those kids. Well, that's not true, Mrs. Eggers. What? We do. 8.14 p.m. Policewoman Irene Gardner and I left the office and drove over to the address the Eggers woman had given us. The house was a small, one-story, clabbered building located on the rear of the lot. The front yard was overgrown with weeds, and there were neighborhood advertising papers lying around. When we arrived, there was a faint light on in one of the front rooms. Irene and I went up to the front door, and we knocked. We got no answer. I tried the door, but we found it locked. There was no sound from inside the place. The shades were drawn over the windows so that it was impossible for us to see into the house. We walked around to the rear and tried the back door. Locked. Yeah, doesn't look like there's anybody home. Uh-huh. Well, let's talk to that Agers woman again, huh? All right. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? From the story she gave us, the kid should be at home. Well, she might be seeing things, Joe. You know, trying to figure out some way to get attention. Yeah, it might be. Didn't seem like that to me, though. Joe? What? What do you got there? The front window. There, you see it? Yeah. There's somebody in there. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Not answering. Come on, open up in there. We know you're in there. Come on. Open the door. What do you want? 
Police officers, let us in. There's nothing wrong. Go away. No, we can't do that. Now, come on, open up. Who are you going to arrest? Nobody. We just want to talk to you. You sure that's all? That's right. Okay. Just a minute. What do you want? Are you Pamela Telford? I haven't done anything wrong. Well, we didn't say you did. Then what are you doing around here? What are you looking for? Is your mother in? What? Is your mother home? Well, yeah, she's here. Well, we'd like to see her if it's all right. You can't. You can't see her. Well, afraid we're going to have to. She's lying down, asleep. That's why you can't talk to her. Well, what's the matter, little girl? Nothing. Why'd you have something like that? Don't you think you better let us in? We're going to have to talk to your mother. But she's asleep. She's tired. You can't talk to her. You can't. Ah, come on. You want to go in and wake her up? There's some things we've got to talk to her about. I wonder if we could come in. It's kind of wet out here. Hmm? How about it? And then you can get your mother and we can have our talk, huh? I guess you can come in. I guess it's all right. Come on in, Joe. Yeah. The front room was about 12 feet square. The only light in the room came from a candle and a jelly glass on a table. The only furniture in the place was the table that held the candle and a torn artificial leather and chrome couch. The floor was covered with paper, rain-soaked cardboard boxes, and dirty clothes. At a half a dozen different places, drops of dirty water were seeping through the roof. The water was being caught in empty tin cans that had been placed around the room. To the left was a door to a bedroom. In it, in a wooden crib, were two children. From the descriptions we'd gotten from the Eggers woman, we recognized them as Martin Telford, age four, and his sister Carol, age two. As soon as the children saw Irene and me, they hid their heads under the dirty blanket that covered the crib. There was nothing else in the room except a dirty mattress lying on the floor in one corner. From the appearance of the bedding, it hadn't been laundered or changed in at least three weeks. On the other side of the house, a small kitchen was piled high with dirty dishes, pieces of rotting food, and empty tin cans. The plumbing in the house had apparently been out of order for several weeks. While Irene and I looked over the house, the girl who'd met us at the door, Pamela Telford, followed us. When we got back to the front room, she started to cry. All right, you want to tell us where she is? Come on, Pamela, it's not as bad as all that, is it? Here, here's a handkerchief. Here you are. Now, where's your mother? She's out looking for a job. It's kind of late for that, isn't it? I don't know. That's what she's doing, though. Out looking for a job. Well, now, why'd you tell us that she was here tonight? Because I didn't know what you wanted. I thought you were trying to arrest her. Well, why'd you think that? Because that's what she said. Your mother said that? Yes. She told us that policemen arrested people. She told us about it. How you did it once to her. Your mother's been arrested? Yes. Do you know why? Because she was. Well, what for, do you know? She got sick. She got sick and they put her in jail. Mm -hmm. That's why I told you she was asleep. I thought that you'd go away and leave us alone. It's sure cold in here. Yeah. Do you have any heat in the house, Pamela? There's a heater in the bedroom. Oh, I'll turn it on. Good. It doesn't work. What? The heater doesn't work. Marty was playing one day and he broke the little rods in it. It doesn't work anymore. Well, we should be able to get some heat out of it. No, you won't. There isn't any gas. They turned it off. Uh-huh. Well, I think maybe you youngsters better come downtown with us, don't you think? Why? Well, it'll be warm down there, a lot more comfortable for you. We can't go. we got to wait here. That's all right, Pamela. We'll leave word for your mother where you are. Maybe that's your mother now, huh? No, it's Steve. Who are you? He's a policeman. What do you want? There's nothing wrong here. Nothing for you to come butting in for. We want to see your mother, son. She hasn't done anything. Why don't your cops leave her alone? All the time you're after, never leave her alone. You're kind of rough for a little guy, aren't you? That's none of your business. I know my rights. I know I'm good. Well, look here, son. We're going to take you downtown and give you a good meal, just until we can talk to your mother, that's all. Then you're going to bring us back? Well, we'll see. How about Marty and Carol? You taking them, too? Yeah. Going to give Dad something to eat? Yes, that's right. Okay, we'll go with you. Just for tonight, though, that's all. Just for tonight. You understand? Yeah. One another thing. Yes, what's that? We're paying our own way. I've got money. Anything you give us, we're going to pay for. Well, you won't have to do that, son. Well, I'm going to. We don't need charity. We're getting along all right. Everybody has a little rough luck now and then. Everybody. Mom tries. She really does. She's been looking for a job for a long time. Uh-huh. All right, Steve, you want to help get the others ready to leave? I'm not sure we can go. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to, son. All right, but just for tonight. 
But the only reason is that I want Marty and Carol and Pamela to have something hot to eat. There's something wrong with the stove since we can't cook on it. That's the only reason we're going. Just because there's something wrong with the stove. The gas is turned off. No, it isn't. It just don't work. But whatever we eat, whatever we get, we're going to pay for it. I've got the money. Oh, well, I told you once before that won't be necessary. But it is, too. We're not taking any charity. We've never taken any. We're not going to start now, either. Anything that's done for us is going to be paid for. Yeah, I guess that's right, Steve. Huh? It'll be paid for. Eight fifty-six p.m. Men from the crime lab arrived and photographed the entire house. The pictures were held for evidence. A search of the house showed that there was no food for the children. In a cardboard box in the bedroom under a pile of toilet articles, we found a photograph of a man and a woman taken at what appeared to be a beach photographer's. Irene and I checked through the rest of the house, but we found nothing that would indicate where the mother of the four Telford children had gone. The youngsters were taken to juvenile hall, bathed, given clean clothes, and fed. At first, Steve Telford refused to eat anything until he was assured that his two sisters and his brother were being given the same kind of food. After the boy had finished eating, Irene and I talked to him. His previous uncooperative attitude had changed, and he seemed anxious to help us find his mother. This is the longest she's ever been gone. I began to think there might be something wrong. Well, when did you see her last, Steve? This is Friday, isn't it? Yes, February 8th. Uh-huh. It was last Tuesday, then. You mean this week, son? No, a week ago. A week ago, Tuesday. Well, what did she say when she left? Just like always. She said she wasn't feeling very good, and she was going out and trying to look for work. What kind of work does she do? Well, she's a waitress. A good one, too. Mm-hmm. That's a trouble, I guess. She's so good. What do you mean? Well, there are only a couple of places that Mom says are any good. Well, you know, where she want to work. I don't believe I understand what you mean, Steve. Well, Mom always said that she wasn't just a hash slinger. That's what she called it. Oh, I see. She said that she was a waitress and she couldn't go to work just any place. Mm-hmm. Where'd she work last? A big place out in Beverly Hills. Forgot the name right now. How long did your mother work there? Well, she, she had some trouble and she had to quit. Well, what do you mean, trouble? Well, she got sick and the man who was her boss got mad at her. And I guess he said a lot of things that Mom didn't like. So Mom told him that he couldn't talk to her like that, and then she quit. Your mother ever tell you what was wrong with her? Steve? No, she didn't. Did you see a doctor about it? You might as well know it. You're going to find out anyway. What's that, son? Well, Mom drank a lot. Sometimes she'd drink too much, and then she'd get sick. That's what was wrong. Mm-hmm. Where's your father, Steve? He died before Carol was born. Right before. I want you to take a look at a picture for us, will you? Look at it and tell us if you know who the man in it is. All right. There you are. That's Mom. Mm Mm-hmm. You know who the man is? No. I don't think I ever saw him before. Does your mother have any men friends? No, I don't think so. At least she never told me about him. She always said that the kids were enough for her, that we were all that mattered. She used to say that when she got a steady job, we were all going to live good. She used to tell us how one day the phone would ring and all our troubles would be over. Just like that. One day we've had a little trouble, and the next, everything was going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Well, she really believed it, too. Just all of a sudden, the phone was going to ring, and all our troubles would be over. Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to tell her. Tell her what, son? That they turned the phone off. We had the name Rowena Telford checked through R&I. We found that the boy's story was true. The woman had been arrested once on a charge of 4127A LAMC, being drunk in a public place. Irene put in a call to the waitresses' union and asked them to check to see if the woman was working any place in town. They came back with the information that the last job she'd held had been six months before and that she'd been fired for insubordination and for being drunk. We showed the picture of the man and woman that we'd found at the Telford home around the department in the hopes that one of the officers might recognize the place where it was taken. None of them did. The next morning, we had several copies made, and we began a search of the bars along 5th Street. We asked each bartender if he'd ever seen the man or the woman. In the first four places we checked, we got yes answers to the query about the woman, but none of the people we talked to could tell us anything about the man in the picture. Two more days passed without results. In the meantime, a warrant had been issued ordering the arrest of Rowena Telford, charging her with child neglect. A local and an APB were gotten out on her. On the third day after we'd started our search for the missing woman, we talked with a bartender who was able to give us the name of the man in the picture. He described the man as a fry cook in one of the smaller restaurants down on 5th Street. We checked the restaurant, but we found that he'd been fired on Monday, the 28th of January. A check of his home address gave us no indication as to where he might be. Irene and I went back to the office and checked the name through R&I. 
Joe? Yeah. Did you come up with anything? Check the name. He's registered as an ex-convict. Uh-huh. Where'd he fall? Back in Pennsylvania. Did time for ADW. Well, we better talk to him, huh? Right now, he looks awful good. Well, why do you say that? What he was arrested for. Yeah. He tried to beat a woman to death. <laughs> immediate search was started for the man in the picture with Rowena Telford. From friends of his, we found that we might be able to locate him at a hamburger stand down at Santa Monica. Tuesday, February 12th, policewoman Irene Gardner and I drove down to the beach. Should be it up there, huh? Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. It's warm in here. Yeah. Yeah? We'd like to see Willis Thatcher. What for? Police officers. You're Thatcher, aren't you? Yeah, what do you want with me? A couple questions we'd like to ask you. Sure, I got nothing to hide. No reason to give you any trouble. What do you want to know? You know a woman named Rowena Telford? Why do you ask that? It's a simple question, Thatcher. Can you give us the right kind of an answer? How about it? Yeah, I know her. Why? What's she done now? When did you see her last? I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Narrow that down, will you? Why? Listen, anything she did, I had no part of. We understand you were pretty friendly with her. That's not true. Sure, maybe I had a couple of dates with her. Not more than a couple. That's it. And anybody in the world could put up with it for more than that. Why do you say a thing like that? You ever know her? No, we're looking for her. You? No, I've never met her. That's how come you can ask that kind of question. And if you knew her, if you spent any time with her, you had to know what I mean. I well, suppose you tell us. She's a lush. A real lush. All the time boozing it up. It wasn't so bad that she got loaded, but she was real loud when she was tanked up. Real loud. Is that right? Sure, check around. Ask her friends. Talk to them. They'll all tell you the same story. Every one of them. First off, she'd have a couple of drinks. Next thing you know, any fellow with her would be trying to get out of a place without getting his head knocked off. She was always starting trouble. Sit down, order a drink. The next thing you know, some guy was asking you outside. Well, I ain't built to go outside too often. I get hurt bad when I fight. Mm Mm-hmm. She have any other boyfriends? You don't listen very good, do you? What's that? I told you, isn't anybody around here that had much to do with her. As far as I know, there wasn't nobody who went with her. How'd she seem the last time you saw her? All right. She had a little hangover. She always had one of those. Seemed depressed about anything? Not that she talked about. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you say anything about leaving town? Not to me. Listen, how about giving me a break and telling me what this is all about? What are you after Rowena for? These fights you told us about. Do you ever have any arguments with Ms. Telford? I don't think that's any of your business. We're writing it down that it is. Now, how about an answer? Well, we had a couple of beefs. I told you, you couldn't go around with her and not have a little trouble. Did you ever hit her? We're back to that, huh? What do you mean? You know the record, the time I did. You figure maybe I did something to Rowena, isn't that it? You think I hurt her? We're asking you. Well, you're way off the road. I ain't going to try to con you. Sure, maybe I had a lot of reasons to want a belter. I used to think a lot of Rowena. Awful lot. But that's all over. All I want her to do is to leave me alone. Stay away from me. I didn't ever hit her. I didn't hurt her, no matter what you think. All right. You got to believe that. I guess it sounds funny. I ain't trying to fool anybody. I'm ready to admit it. I'm a bum. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to keep telling me, not all the time. I knew it. Nobody likes to be called a bum. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if you know it's true. 1.47 p.m. We drove the suspect over to his rooming house and we checked the premises. We found nothing that would definitely tie him in with the disappearance of the Telford woman. After leaving his room, we took him downtown where he was held for further investigation on a charge of suspicion of murder. We checked communications, but we found that there'd been no word on the missing woman. Her name and description had been checked through the files and missing persons bureau without results. 3.40 p.m. Frank came by the office and said that the trial he was attending was dragging on and that it would be a couple more days before he'd be back on duty with me. A petition was filed on behalf of the children charging violation of Section 273A PC, unfit home, asking that they be made wards of the juvenile court. Policewoman Irene Gardner put in a call to the next-door neighbor of the Telford woman, but we'd found that there'd been no trace of the missing woman since we'd removed the children. 5.12 p.m. We finished up the log for the day and we were leaving the office. I got it. Juvenile Friday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what's that address? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, we'll be right there. Right, thank you. What do you got? Bar over on East 6th. Yeah? Rowena Telford just walked in. The bartender was one of those that we'd questioned when we first started our investigation. At the time, he knew the Telford woman, but he said that he hadn't seen her for several weeks. On the phone, he told me that she just walked into his bar. Irene Gardner and I left the office and drove over to the East 6th Street address, but the woman had just left. 
We had her description and a description of the clothes she was wearing. We put that out to all cars in the area, but she was not picked up. Irene Gardner and I went back to the office, and we put out a supplementary bulletin on the woman. At 8.14 p.m., we got a call from the woman who'd made the original complaint, Mrs. Crystal Eggers. She told us that the Telford woman had just walked into her own home. Irene and I left the office, and we drove out to the house on Vallejo Street. Light on. She must still be home. Yeah. Who is it? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. It's about time you got here. You got me? I beg your pardon? You got the little brat? They all run off, all of them. Get my hands on them, and they're going to get what for. Where are they? We have them downtown, Miss Telford. Why don't you bring them home? This is where they belong. I get my hands on them. Oh, what I'm going to give that little Steve. You mind if we come in? No, come right ahead. You got to kind of excuse the way the house looks. I've been away for a couple of days. You can see how the kids can mess the place up. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Miss Gardner. Oh, how do you do? Would you like to, sir? No, that's all right. How come you didn't bring them back? They're being held in juvenile hall, Miss Telford. For what? Well, when we found them, they were suffering from malnutrition. This place here, it's not fit for youngsters. Oh, so you just took them out and put them in a home. It's the way it is? Yes, ma'am, that's the way it is. Well, you've got your nerve. You really have. What? You, coming in here and breaking up a home like this. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. We have a warrant for your arrest. Me? Yes, ma'am. Now, you listen to me, cop. You've got no right to come in here and break up my home. I know all about you cops. All about you pussyfooting around trying to make everybody think you're so good. I know you for what you are, and I'll tell you this. Yes, ma'am, what's that? You better get those kids back here fast, do you hear me? You get them back here fast, because if you don't, I'm going to sue you and her and the city for every dime it's got. I'll take this to any court in the country I have to, but I'm going to get my kids back. You ain't half as good as you think you are. You want it plain, real plain, so you can understand it? You stink, that's what. All of you stink. All right, ma'am, I think that's enough of that. Where have you been for the last two weeks? It's the most terrible thing that ever happened to me. To anybody. He told me he loved me and said we was going to get married. I thought it'd be nice for the kids. That's what I thought, for the kids. And we was going to drive down to Mexico and get married. It's all nice. Mm-hmm. And everything's going nice. I gave Stevie a couple of dollars and told him to take care of things. And then we left and drove all the way to San Diego without stopping. And then we had some lunch on the way to get married. And we had a couple of drinks just to make the food taste better, that's all. And then all of a sudden I got sick again. And he walked out on me. Left me right there in the bar all by myself. And all the promises he made to me, all the things he was going to have, and all of it, just a lot of lies. As soon as I get a little sick, he just had a couple of drinks. He walked out on me, left me right there, all by myself, you know. Mm -hmm. All by myself. I didn't have no money, no way to get back. What was I going to do? I believed him. I really thought he was going to marry me. I believed all he said, how things were going to be better. I believed it all. It's the dirtiest trick I ever heard of, walking out on a girl like that. A dirty trick. I got one to beat it. Hmm? The one you pulled on your children. <laughs> Rowena Esther Telford was tried and convicted of violation of Section 273A, P.C., endangering the life and safety of a minor, which is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. The four Telford children were made wards of the juvenile court and were placed in foster homes. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A pair of thieves has been terrorizing the merchants in your city. They're described as a man and a woman. From their actions, you know they're capable of murder. Your job, stop them. It was Wednesday, July 23rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stab Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the main jail, and it was 8.16 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, Slats. Joe? Any word from Frank? Yeah, I talked to Skipper this morning. He said they were having a little trouble with that extradition. Anything big? No, I guess not. Chief Brown said the authorities back in St. Louis would get it straightened out. Frank ought to be back in the middle of next week. Mm-hmm. Skipper said he wants me to work with you on that liquor store thing. Kathleen and I can use some help. We run down just about every lead there is. They all end up in the same place. Well, I got a little of it. You want to fill me in on the rest? Yes. Hot shot. I'll get it. Well, you can get it firsthand. Yeah? They just scored again. Sergeant Slats Henry, Tom Gaffney, and I went downstairs to the carpool. We took out our robbery car, and we rolled on the call code three. It took us a little over ten minutes to get to the corner of Alexandria and Burns Avenues. The place that had reported being robbed was a small neighborhood liquor store. By the time we'd gotten there, a radio car had answered the call, and a felony car from Hollywood Division had gotten there. While Gaffney talked with the men in the felony car, Slats and I went inside the store to see the victim. The uniformed officer who was with him told us that the elderly man's name was Charles Osborne. We got what information the officer had been able to get, and while he went to his unit to get out a broadcast on the suspects, Slats and I talked to Osborne. Well, there isn't much to tell. I guess they worked it the same way they've been doing. Just the way how it tells in the papers. The same. Mm -hmm. There were two of them, were there? Yeah, the man and the woman, two. Might be better if you told us just exactly what happened. Well, just pick up any paper. It's all there. They've been doing the same thing for a couple of weeks. I don't understand it. I don't. What's that, Mr. Osborne? Well, these two just walk into any store and take what they want. You guys don't seem to be able to stop them. You go great guns after they've held up somebody. Then you're great. But where are you when they're doing the robbing, huh? Where are you then? Where? Well, if you'll just calm down here and tell us what happened, we might be able to do something about it. Oh. Well, they come in just like always. About what time was that? Well, it must have been around eight. I was a little too busy to look at my watch. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead? Well, there was two of them, man and the woman. Yes, sir. Man and the woman stood over there at the door... Woman walked right up here at the counter, right up, stood there. First off, I thought she had a cold or something. Wasn't long that thought held on, though. No, sir, not long at all. Yes, sir. Eh, turned out to be a mask. Handkerchief, you know, right across here. Right here across her face. About that time, of course, I realized there was something was wrong, you know. Anybody walks into a store with a mask off, they don't mean no good. Oh, none. Yes, sir. Did you get a good look at the pair before they put the masks on? No, sir, not at all. No, no. They had them kind of up over their mouths when they come in, kind of like they was going to cough or something. Then they took their hands away, and I could see that the handkerchief was tied right on. Tied. Yes, sir. You want to go ahead? Well, this woman come over the counter and asked me for a bottle of Canadian whiskey. Just as calm as can be. I sparked right out. Now, mind, you see, all this time I thought she had a cold. Yes, sir. I walked over, you see, there. Yeah, that's where I keep the Canadian stuff and got a bottle. I see. Got it right down, and I turned around, and there she was, just standing there with the mask on. Had it tied right around, tied. Yes, sir. What happened then? Well, I asked them what the big idea was. I thought that maybe they was playing a little joke, you see. They was, but it was on me. Woman told me to put the bottle in the paper bag and put the money in the bag, too. Told me to open the register and just put all the money right in the bag. Did you see if they were armed? No wonder you haven't caught them. Sir? You got a life-size picture of me giving them the money if they wasn't armed. You got that kind of idea? No, sir. We just want to know if they had guns. Well, of course they had guns. Did you see them? Well, naturally. Right out in the open? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait a second. Come right down to it. I didn't actually see them. 
The fellow, he was at the door over there. He had his hand in his pocket. She had her hand in a purse, see? Like this. Mm-hmm. You see? Mm-hmm. Like this, kind of... Come right down to it, I didn't really see him, no. But I'm sure they was there, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Well, what happened after the woman asked for the money? Well, her and the fellow just told me not to move for five minutes. Had me to keep real still. That I wouldn't get hurt. I just took it easy. And they left the store. Did they walk away from the place? Oh, no, no, sir. They had a car parked right out in front. Right in front. Got into that and roared down the street. I counted to a hundred uh, by ones and then called you. Did the uniformed officer get a description of the car? Yes, yes, i give it to him right off. All right, Mr. Osborne, if you'd give us a description of the pair. Well, the woman was about, uh, oh, is it maybe five foot three, around in there, waiting around, oh, 130. Mm-hmm. How about the color of her hair? Red, just flaming red. Had blue eyes, so I guess her hair really was that color. What color were the eyes? Uh, flaming red. Flaming red. I told you that no, before. No, sir, not, yes. her, not her, eye, her yes, eyes. Yes. Oh, oh, her eyes. Oh, <laughs> I'm all confused here. Well, uh, her eyes were blue. Yes, sir. So that's how I knew that. Hair was bright red. What was she wearing? Oh, had on a kind of barrette, uh, green, kind of green coat, red purse, red shoes, low heel. The, uh, the front was cut out. Mm-hmm. How about the man? What did he look like? Oh, he's a big one. He must have been around six feet. I I couldn't tell too good because he was standing over there with a the door. Oh, but he was a big one, I tell you. He weighed about 170, maybe more. How about his coloring? Dark. Dark hair. Dark eyes. Of course, I couldn't see anything very good. And then he had that mask on. What was he wearing? He had a blue suit on. looked kind of like it was linen. Uh, How about his shirt and tie? White shirt, black tie. Shirt was a button-down collar. Uh, no hat. Did either one of them have any marks or scars that might make it easier to identify them? Not that I could see, no, sir. Well, how about accents? Either of them have any kind of speech peculiarity? No. Exactly what the woman say to you. Do you remember the words she used? Uh-huh. Well, first off, she asked for the whiskey. Said, uh, give me a bottle of Canadian whiskey. Didn't mention any special brand. Mm-hmm. Then when I bought it back, she said, uh, just put it in the paper bag and empty the register in there, too. That's what the woman said. Did the man say anything at all? Well, when they was leaving, he said, Stay put, Pop. Stay there for five minutes. You won't get hurt. Those are his words. Exact. I remember them. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. We'd like you to come downtown and check some pictures for us, if you will. Well, I guess it'll be all right. You guys should sure get on the ball, though. It's getting pretty bad. Sir? (laughs) Seems a little silly you can't catch these people right out instead of rushing around locking the door after the horse has been stole. A little late, then, seems to me. Yes, sir. Well, they've been pretty lucky. They'll probably try the same thing again. Uh, yeah. We'll try to be there the next time. A search of the immediate area failed to turn up anything that might lead to the identity of the thieves. A broadcast had been gotten out to all cars in the city, giving the description of the couple, the automobile they were driving, and the clothes they were wearing. The pair had been operating in the city for the past three weeks. In that time, they'd established a fairly definite method of operation. Two days before they planned to work, they'd steal a car. Then, on the night that they started their operation, they'd pick one of the city's main arterials and start at one end of it. They'd hit three or four stores in the area in a period of half an hour. The stolen car would be parked on a side street, and the couple would make good their escape. All of the routine efforts had been made to identify them. Due to the fact that a woman was involved in the operation, the state adult authority for women had been contacted for the names of recent parolees. But when these had been checked out, we netted nothing. Because of the circumstances of the M.O., we felt that the first break in the case would come through the woman. The stats office had made several runs, and the possibles had been checked out. Results, nothing. Five minutes after we'd left the first victim, we got another call. The parrot hit again, further down on Alexandria Avenue. All right, let us through here, please. Please, officers, let Let us through. through. Please. Yes. You the cop? Yes, sir, that's right. I'm the fellow was robbed. I'm him. Slatch, you want to see if you can try to clear the front of the place? Right. Okay. All right, sir, if you'd like to tell us what happened here. Terrible. Most terrible thing that ever happened to me. Yes, sir. I got to have a little something to calm my nerves. Got to. Well, can I get you anything, sir? Uh, I don't have to, son. I got all right here. A whole store full of it. Just a minute. Yes, sir. A little brandy, that's what I need. Yeah, mother's sure going to think I took the little nip just to have it. 
Going to have to explain the whole thing to her. Imagine me being robbed. Yes, sir. Now, if you tell us what happened here. Yeah. Oh. Excuse me. You like a little of this? No, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. These two came in here not more than five minutes ago. Man and woman. Came right in and asked for a bottle of whiskey. Mm-hmm. Do you recall what brand? Didn't ask for no special brand. Just said they wanted Canada whiskey. Blend. Mm-hmm. You'd be able to give us a description of them? Well, the woman had red hair, and that's about the only thing I do remember about her. Other than the way she talked. How do you mean, sir? Foul mouth. The way she swore at me. Just something fierce. What did she say? Oh, just swear words, you know. I guess I didn't get the bottle fast enough for him. She told me to hurry up. Only she didn't say it just like that. Where was the man during this time? Oh, he was over here at the cash register with gun. For the woman there, too? Oh, no. No, she stayed over by the door. Seemed to be the lookout or something. She didn't come much past uh, there. Mm-hmm. Right there by the potato chip rack. That's about as far as she come. Mm-hmm. And you said they used guns. Did you get a look at them? Oh, yeah. Big ones. I guess they must have been that long. And the bear must have been that big round. Mm-hmm. What kind of a gun was it, would you know? I don't think I know what you mean. Or was it an automatic or a revolver? And I'm sorry, officer, but I don't understand. All I know it was the biggest gun I ever saw. Must have been that long, that big around. Did it look like this one? Oh, no. No, that's just a pea shooter compared to the one that fellow was waving around. Did you see a car when they left? Yes, I did. Right out in front it was. Parked in front of the sign. Hey, you see there where it says reserved for patron? Yes, sir. Uh, right there. That's where the car was. After the fellow told me to dump the cash into the paper bag with the bottle, the woman opened the door and both of them ran out and jumped into the car. Roared off down the street. But I got a good look at it. Real good. Mm-hmm. Then you can give us a description of it. You bet I can. Dark, 1953 Ford sedan. Four-door. Had one of them sun things on the front. You know, like a shade. Yes, sir. Used to have them on the buggage when I was a young man. <laughs> Guess if you wait long enough, they... Get back to everything. Yes, sir. How much money did they get away with, sir? Oh, I guess it must have been around $225. Round in there someplace. Give a couple, take a couple. Mm-hmm. Do you think you'd know either one of these people if you ever saw them again? No. You just bet I would. Even with those masks on, I'd be able to pick them right out of a crowd. You just stand them up in front of me and I'll point them out. I'll never forget that gun. Biggest gun I ever saw. Must have been that long, that big around. That one you got there is a real pea shooter. Mm-hmm. How's he look, Joe? Well, it's the same couple. The description fits perfectly. I checked around the people in the crowd, found one old guy who says he saw the pair come out of the store. Got a good description of the car. Mm-hmm. I already gave him one. If I can tell you anything you want to know. Yes, sir, we appreciate that, but we do want to talk to everybody who knows anything about the holdup. All right. You go ahead and talk to the other fellow. You go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah, but I got something he can't give you. What's that, sir? License number of the car they drove. An immediate supplementary broadcast was gotten out to the cars in the area with special attention to the units covering Alexandria Avenue. The search for the pair of thieves went on, but as the hours passed and they failed to hit again, it became apparent that they had eluded us again. The next morning, the car was found abandoned on the east side of Los Angeles. It was a stolen vehicle, and after it had been checked for the crime lab for latent prints, we were no further toward apprehending the suspects conference was held with the chief of detectives, Thad Brown, and it was decided to place an extensive stakeout on the liquor stores in the Hollywood area. From past performances, the pair seemed to work their operation in that general area more than the other parts of town. The stakeout was maintained for three days without results. On Tuesday night, July 29th, Sergeant Henry and I waited in the squad room for reports from the other officers out in the field. 1.15 a.m. Well, looks like another night shot. Yeah, still no action. Stores will be closing in about 45 minutes now. Yeah. You got a cigarette? I'm out. Yeah. I think there's a couple left in here. Yeah, just two. Here, go ahead. I'll go down the hall and get a couple of things. Oh, that's all right. Here. Heard from Frank? No, I talked to Faye night before last. She got a letter from him. Said he thought he'd be back about the end of the week. See how it's going? No, he just read me a couple parts of the letter. I guess it's all straightened out. Suspect's coming back on his own. Well, extraditions can sure be a pain. I had to go back to New Orleans on one last year. Had a miserable time. Guy gave us a lot of trouble. Yeah, I remember. I get it. Now, let's go. They just hit again. 
the stakeout area? No, out in Highland Park. They're way out on this one. What do you mean? Well, the victim decided to give him a little trouble. Yeah? The male suspect broke off the bottom of a whiskey bottle and worked the victim over. Mm -hmm. Almost killed him. At 1.13 a.m., the pair of thieves had entered a small all-night grocery store in the Highland Park area. They'd gone through the usual part of their M.O., asking for the bottle of Canadian whiskey and then the money. However, when they asked the victim to turn over the money to them, he had told them to get out of the store. The male member of the team had grabbed the bottle, hit it against the counter, breaking off the bottom, and then struck the victim several times about the head and shoulders. When we'd gotten the call, the man had been removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where he was in a critical condition. An immediate search of the area had failed to turn up anything that might lead us to the apprehension of the man and woman. A citywide broadcast was gotten out on the pair, and arrangements were made for their description to be broadcast on the police television program. Newspapers carried the stories and joined with us in asking for full cooperation from the public. For the next three days, we received several calls with information on the suspects, but when all of these were checked and sifted, we were right back where we started. The stakeouts were maintained on the liquor stores, but the suspects failed to hit again. On Monday, August 4th, we got a call from the county hospital telling us that the latest victim was in condition to be interviewed. Slats Henry and I drove over to see him. He was unable to tell us anything more than the dozen victims before him had told us. 3.15 p.m., we went back to the office. Want to check the book? Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah, there's a message here that a Reese McKay called. He left a number. Say what he wanted? No, he just wants us to call. Table. We gotta put something under this leg. It sure wobbles, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Been that way for years. Yeah. Like to speak to Mr. Reese McKay, please. My name's Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. No, Police Department. Yes, yeah, surely. It's the attorney's office. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. This is Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. Certainly. When was this? Mm hmm. All right, sir. No, we'll be right over. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, might be something. What did he say? Woman was in his office this afternoon. Yeah. Said something about being involved in the robbery. <laughs> Sergeant Henry and I signed out of the office and drove over to the address the lawyer had given me on the phone. We waited in the reception room for a few minutes, and then his secretary ushered us into Mr. McKay's office. Come in, gentlemen. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I'm Reese McKay. Yes, sir. This is Sergeant Henry. My name's Friday. Oh, yes. You're the gentleman I talked to on the phone. That's right. Well, sit down, and I'll try and tell you what happened. All right. Thank you very much. You've got to realize my problem in this thing. Yes, sir. What's that? Well, if this isn't anything worthwhile, I certainly don't want to have a client embarrassed. You can understand that. Yes, sir. I suppose I'd just tell you what happened, and we can go on from there. All right. That'll be fine. A couple of days ago, I got a call from a young woman who said she wanted me to handle a divorce for her. Mm -hmm. Uh, We set up an appointment for her this afternoon. She came in and we went over the problem. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of the divorce action. I don't think that'll have any bearing on the rest of it. All right, sir. Well, to get to the short of it, we were going over the necessary information. The door burst open. This man came in. Mm Mm-hmm. I wanted to know what it was all about. My secretary was right behind him, seeing that he just pushed his way right through the reception room. Well, who was he, do you know? Well, he said he was the woman's husband. Is that true? Well, apparently, I told my secretary to wait outside. Then I asked him what he wanted. He didn't pay any attention to me at first, said it wasn't any of my concern, and told me to keep my nose out of it. Mm Mm-hmm. And he and the woman had a big discussion. Seems that he didn't want her to divorce him. Made all sorts of promises how things would be different if she came back to him. Mm-hmm. First, she seemed to go along with the idea. As you know, we uh, we like to effect a reconciliation wherever possible. So I told him to go ahead and talk it over. Mm-hmm. Well, I left him in the office and went out of the reception room. And for a while, it seemed they were getting along all right. And the shouting died down, and they seemed to have agreed. And all of a sudden, it broke loose again. They started to scream at each other, and I went right back in the office. And just as I opened the door... I heard the man tell her that if she didn't come back, he'd cause her a lot of trouble. Mm. He said for her to remember that she was mixed up in the holdups, too. And these were the exact words. Don't forget, you're mixed up in those stick-ups as deep as me. I see. Can you give us the name and address of the couple? Yes, sir. I have it right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pretty difficult to imagine that she'd be involved in anything like that. Pretty woman, beautiful hair. Is that right? Yes, flaming red. We obtained the address the woman had given Reese McKay, and we checked her name through R&I. We found no criminal record on anyone answering her description. While Slats called Chief Brown and told him what had happened, I asked the record division to make a run on the husband. 
We found that he'd been arrested three years before for attempted armed robbery, but that he'd been released for lack of evidence. 5.40 p.m. Slats and I drove over to the woman's address. The name on the mailbox in the apartment lobby read Mr. and Mrs. George Winston. We rang the bell and we identified ourselves. You want to come in? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here, ma'am? You mean in the apartment? Yes. No, I'm alone. Where's that door lead, ma'am? Bedroom. You mind if we take a look? Maybe you better tell me what this is all about first, huh? You better go ahead, Slant. Yeah. I suppose you're used to hearing that you've got a lot of nerve. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's true. What's this all about? Isn't there some law that says you've got to make a complaint or something? Where's your husband? That's bum. Where is he? I don't know, and I don't care if I never see him again. Nothing but trouble did I ever get from him. Miserable man. Mm-hmm. You haven't any idea where he is? No. I don't think I'd tell you if I did until you let me know what this is all about. What's your husband do for a living, ma'am? You guys are so interested in him, why don't you ask him yourselves? Place is clean, Joe. Mm-hmm. I told you that going in. What's this all about? Now, come on, tell me or get out. We understand you and your husband had an argument this morning. Two of you mentioned something about a robbery. Oh, I understand it all now. Now it's all real plain. Look, what George said was a joke. That's all just a joke. He didn't mean anything by it. The way we got the story sounded pretty straight. You got it a little mixed up. Well, maybe you better come downtown and tell us all about it, huh? What for? Oh, well, we've got some people down there we'd like you to meet. i got enough friends. Well, then let's put it down to these people who'd like to meet you. Do you want to get your coat? I think there's supposed to be something like a charge, isn't there? Yes, ma'am, if that's the way you want it. I do. All right, suspicion of robbery. What makes you think you can make it stick? Well, we wouldn't be taking you in if we didn't figure we had a case. You'd save all of us a lot of trouble if you'd tell us where we can pick up your husband. What's in it for me? What do you got now? Nothing. Well, that's the best we can do. What makes you think you can hold up this kind of a charge? A dozen victims, for one thing. Flats, you want to check the closet and see if you can find a green coat and the red shoes and purse? Yeah. What happens if I've got a green coat? Well, it makes us look pretty good, doesn't it? A lot of girls got green coats. Yeah, we're looking for one. She's supposed to look like me? Description we've got matches exactly. A lot of people in the world look like me. Same people who have green coats. Mm-hmm. Got them, Joe. Found them up on the shelf in the closet. Take a look. They match what we heard. Yeah, would you like to try this coat on, Miss Winston? And then we can get going. Okay, but you guys are sure going to find out that you're wrong. Is that right? You just bet, and it's going to cost the city a lot of money because I'm really going to make a big thing out of this. Well, if we're wrong, we'll admit it. Then you admit you could be making a mistake. No, we don't. I read in the papers where there was an old guy beat up in a robbery. Same ones you're after me for? Might be, yeah. How's he doing, the old guy? Well, we're not sure yet. He's going to live, though, isn't he? I told you, Miss Winston, we're not sure. You got a cigarette? Yes, ma'am, here. I want you to tell me something. Tell me true. What's that? You really think you can put me in those stores? Yes, we do. I can't make a deal, huh? I'll tell you things and have it go any easier? No, ma'am. All we can do is see that it's marked down that way. Best I can get? That's the best. I'll take it. What? I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you the whole thing. All right. Go ahead. Well, you got the right people, me and George. I knew when he hit that old man we'd had it. Knew it right away. That's why we quit. I was afraid. If the guy died, you'd be able to get us for murder. I didn't like the robbery part, but I didn't want any part of a killing. I never did like the setup. Never. I used to tell George I didn't like it. That didn't make any difference to him. He wanted to be the big man. He used to sit here after hitting the places. George would get the morning papers and sit here and laugh at the cops because he had them running after themselves. You know where he is? Yeah. He's in a hotel down on West 7th, using the name Evanston. I'll give you the address. All right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, George. He's going to be real surprised when you walk in on him. Real surprised. Sure wish I could see the expression on his face when he finds out what happened. Sure like to see it. Well, that makes you even, doesn't it? Huh? He'll want to see yours. <laughs> Geraldine Ruth Winston and George Roland Winston were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, five counts. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than five years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb 
a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Sergeant, you're assigned a Bunko fugitive detail. A confidence man has set up operations in your city. The product he's selling has a ready market. Perfect cut blue-white diamonds. Your job? Stop him. It was Tuesday, November 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko fugitive detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the record division, and it was 11.40 a.m. when I got to room 38. Bunko detail. Is it a check out? Yeah, there's three possibles. Descriptions don't match too well. We'll have to check them all out, I guess. Uh-huh. The better was just in, said so he'd give us a hand. That's good. Should we get on it? Yeah. Any calls? No. Let's go. I got it. Bunko Fugitive, Friday. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Well, I'm not sure. No, the officer that handled the case isn't here right now. What if I could take a message? Yes, ma'am. He'll call you when he gets in. All right, uh-huh. Yes, all right. If you'll wait just a minute, I'll transfer it just a minute. Hold on, please. Would you give this call to 2949, please? Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Yes, sir. This the fraud department? Was a bunker fugitive? Yes, sir. Then I guess this is what I want. I'd like to report a swindle. All right, sir. I'll check with the batter, Joe. You can go to work on this list. Right. I'll be right back. Okay. You want to come in, sir? Sit down right here if you like. Okay. Huh? Where would be the best place to start? Would you like to give us your name, sir? Terrell Tilson. That's with an F. F-I-L-S-O-N. Tilson. Yes, sir. What I want to tell you about happened to a friend of mine. All right. Uh, he's a little too embarrassed to come in himself, so I said I'd tell you about it. It's a terrible thing. It should be stopped. All right, sir, we'll do what we can. You want to tell us what it's all about? Well, this friend of mine was in the bank one day. He'd gone in to make withdrawal, a couple of hundred dollars. I see. On the way out of the place, this kind of seedy-looking man came up to my friend and started to talk. Did your friend know the man? Never saw him before in his life. All right, sir, go ahead. Well, this little guy said he had a business proposition to put to my friend. Said they could both make a lot of money out of it. Mm-hmm. The little guy suggested that the both of them walk down the street to a little coffee stand that's there and have a cup of coffee. My friend didn't see anything wrong with that, so they did. That's where the little guy told the story. What was that, sir? Oh, about how he was a DP, you know, a displaced person. Mm -hmm. Said he'd come over from Belgium. Big story about how he just managed to get out of Germany with his life. Really laid it on thick, real thick. Mm -hmm. That's when he pulled a snapper. Said that he'd gotten into the country illegally. That he didn't have any papers, and that's why he came to my friend. I see. Go ahead. And you see, this little guy reached into his pocket, took out a couple of pieces of folded paper. He undid them, and there were four diamonds. Most beautiful thing you ever saw. Mm Mm-hmm. I went on to say that since he was in the country without a passport, he couldn't take the chance of trying to sell the diamonds, said he might be picked up. So he wanted to sell the stones to my friend. Said he wouldn't have any trouble getting rid of them. Well, how much did he want for them, do you know? Yeah. Said he'd sell a lot for $13,000. It's quite a bit, isn't it? Yeah, especially when this friend of mine doesn't know anything about diamonds. 
All right, sir. Do you want to go ahead? Well, the little guy set my friend to take the stones to any jeweler and have them appraised. Said he'd go along with whatever the jeweler said. And that's what your friend did, then? Yeah. Went to one of the best jewelry stores in the city. Took the stones with him and had the jeweler look at them. Now, this little man, did he go into the store with your friend? No, he said he'd wait outside. Uh-huh. Well, the jeweler looked at the stones and said they were worth $15,000. That's wholesale. 15000 So your friend bought the diamonds, did he? Yes. He offered the owner $10,000 cash for them. The little guy wouldn't go for the deal, so he took the diamonds back. They hemmed and hauled around for a couple of minutes, and then he said he'd sell. So both of them went to my friend's bank, got the money, and the deal was set. The little man reached into his pocket, took out the package, handed over the diamonds for the 10000 Mm-hmm. Then my friend tried to sell them. He went back to the same jeweler. And that's when he found out. Yeah. They weren't the same stones. My friend had gotten a different packet. Instead of diamonds, he bought four zircons, worth $25, $30 apiece. $10,000 for $120 worth of cut glass. Now, you've got to do something about it. You've got to figure some way to get that money back. All right. You want to give us a description of the man who sold you the phone? How'd you know? Well, you aren't the only one who's been taken by this racket. There have been several cases the last few months. That's all the more reason you ought to get him. $10,000, that's what he took me for. That's real easy money. Well, the only difference is the amount, isn't it? What do you mean? You tried to take five the same way. Frank came back to the office, and I filled him in on the story Harold Filson had given me. The victim gave us a complete statement and a description of the man who victimized him. He also gave us the address of the bank where he'd been approached. After that, Filson was taken down to the mug room and shown photographs of known confidence men who had used the same M.O. A local and an APB were gotten out, carrying the description of the suspect as well as a complete description of the clothes he wore and the method he used in approaching the intended victim. We got the name of the jeweler who had appraised the diamonds, and we asked the victim if we could keep the stones until we'd finished our investigation. He gave us his consent, and we signed a receipt for the zircons. 1.46 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the Hollywood area where we talked to Saul Maurice, the owner of the jewelry store. All right, if you'll wait, I'll get my loot and check them for you. We'd appreciate that. No trouble. Probably should have known there was something wrong when I came in here. The average man doesn't carry $15,000 and upset diamonds around with him. Uh, let me see the stones. Sure, here you are. Take a look mm-hmm. at these, if you will. Mm-hmm. Well, the same ones, same as diamonds. What can you tell us about them? Well, they look as if they were cut in this country. Yeah? Why do you say that? Facets. They're cut longer than European stones. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. Now they were made in America. Is there any way we could tell where? No. Whoever did it, though, knew what he was doing. I remember the diamonds. Beautiful. You mean the real diamonds were just like these, then, huh? Mm, Yes. There was a 125 round, two one-carat marquee, and a 403 square cut. You sure about the size, are you? Uh, Reasonably, yes. I didn't weigh them at the time, but I did use a mo-gauge on them. That's what they checked out. You can't give us any idea, then, where the Zircons might have come from? No, I'm sorry. I can give you a list of the men in Los Angeles who might have done it. We'd appreciate it. No trouble at all. Uh, you want to take these with you? Yes, sir. Say, I don't understand. Why would a legitimate diamond cutter make these imitations? Well, if a person ordered them copied, there'd be no reason not to. Quite often, people don't like to wear genuine stones. Occasions when good imitations do just as well. That's what probably happened here. Uh-huh. Whoever it was probably ordered a melange lot. The cutter went ahead with it. Well, now, the stones he brought in the first time were real, weren't they? Yes, fine, high color, beautifully cut. Especially the square. I'll get those names for you. Thank you. Say, I wonder if you'd tell me something. Hmm? Well, what's that? Well, my wife's been looking for something to clean her engagement ring. You know, it gets dirty down the little prongs that hold the diamond. I wonder if you could recommend something to clean it. Well, I'll tell you what. Next time you're in the area, bring the ring in. I'll be glad to clean it for you. <laughs> well, the problem there is she doesn't want to take it off, I guess. I don't think she'd go for me taking it all day. Well, I'll tell her to take it into the jeweler in the neighborhood. He'll be glad to do it. Thanks. Sure appreciate it. No trouble at all. Now, here's the list. Thank you. Sure hope you can find the man who sold the phonies. Yes, sir. So do we. Every time somebody gets stung buying diamonds, it makes them leery from then on. Hard on the legitimate people in the business. Yes, sir. We can understand that. Jewelers Alliance has been saying it for a long time. Know your jeweler and you'll get value received. A guy like this makes it twice as rough on honest men. Well, that's the way it is most of the time. Always seems like the honest ones get hurt. Well, maybe not always. What? I hope it's going to work the other way this time. Three fifteen p.m. Frank and I returned to the office and got out a supplemental bulletin on the genuine diamonds that were being used. We checked with Captain Didion, and he assigned two more officers to help us in checking out the list of diamond cutters in the area. The questioning took the better part of the next day, 
And at 4.37 p.m., when we met in the Bunko squad room, we were no further ahead with the apprehension of the suspect. During the week that followed, we continued to talk to the lapidaries in the Southland area, but they were unable to give us any leads as to who might have made the copies. On Monday, November 22nd, we received another complaint. An elderly woman who identified herself as Mrs. Myra Hacken told us that she'd been swindled out of $12,000. The story she gave us was almost identical with the one we'd gotten from Harold Filson. The description of the suspect was the same. Frank and I talked to the jeweler that had made the appraisal on the stones for her. He was unable to give us any concrete information. However, the zircons purchased by Mrs. Hacken were identical with those bought by the first victim, Filson. Two more weeks passed, and in that time, the confidence man hit two more citizens. The method of approach was the same. The story he gave the victims was the same. Nothing in the story was new. The search for him went on. On Wednesday, December 1st, Captain Didion called a meeting in his office. Come in. Sit down. Right. All right. Well, what's it about, Skipper? You know what it is. Where are you on it? Oh, the diamond switch, huh? That's it. Going slow, Captain. Oh, what's the score to date? About $45,000, isn't it? Yeah. You know closer to the guy than when he started. Well, we got a description. We can't book that. We're doing everything we can, Captain. We talked to all the victims, all the people in town who might know who he is. There isn't a rumble. He must be playing it single. None of the usual sources know anything. How about the money? Anybody spending more than they can account for? No, not that we've been able to turn. Stats office? Well, they've given us a list of possible 14 of them. They've all been checked out and unfit. What about the Jewelers Association? What do they got for you? Well, they're doing all they can. They put out a notice to all their members to be on the lookout for the guy. Sent out a description to all the diamond cutters asking for information on the stones. Mm-hmm. We've had a composite drawing made of the suspect. M.O. sheet. It's been sent to all the banks in the area. Nothing back on it, though. Well, what's the answer? Got to be some way of nailing him. Well, we got an idea. The odds are on the long side, I guess, but it's about the only way that we can think of. Let's hear it. Well, we know that the guys work in the Hollywood area pretty heavy. Seems that most of the marks he picks are out there. They do business in those banks along the boulevard. Mm-hmm. We thought that if we could spot a couple of undercover people in the banks and make it look like they were doing business there, they might be approached. You meant it when you said the odds were long. How many people do you figure you're going to need for this? Well, we figure a minimum of a half a dozen. They all should be middle-aged or elderly. Suspect doesn't seem to bother anybody under 40. How about keeping in touch with the undercover people? How do you figure to work that? Well, we thought we could cruise the area, work out some kind of a check system so we'd know what was going on. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll get in touch with Chief Brown. Ask him to line up some officers that'll work at banks. You better get in touch with Hollywood. Fill him in on what you're doing. Might ask for a couple of F cars to give you a hand in the surveillance. Right, Skipper. We'll get together here in the morning. You can brief him on what you want. How are you going to work it out? Okay. Better notify the banks, too. Give them the setup so there won't be any slip. All right. Excuse me. Bunko fugitive, Captain Didion. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll send him right up. That's right. Do what you can. Here's one to move on. Bank on Hollywood Boulevard. Head cashier says there's been a man loitering in the place for the last 30 minutes. Yeah. Matches the description of your suspect right down the line. The man had been detained until we got there. We were told that the suspect had entered the bank at approximately 11.40 a.m. and that he'd been observed by the bank guard. When the man's movements had aroused the guard's suspicions, he'd notified the cashier, and he in turn had called us when he noticed the similarity between the suspect and our bulletin. We asked the suspect to step out to our car so we could question him. He appeared to have been drinking, but he was cooperative. He got into the back seat with Frank, and we asked him to show us his wallet. Hey, uh, my wallet. Is there any money in it? Well, I don't know if that's any of your business. You got any money in the wallet? Well, it might be a couple of bucks, yes. Then again, on the other side of the fence, I might not. All right, mister, take the money out and hand the wallet to me. Ain't none. I'm broke. All right, let's have it. Sure, I'd like to cooperate. Always like to cooperate. All right. This your true name, Samuel Gerald Pugh? That is correct. Ever been arrested? That gentleman is my life story. Is that right? It certainly is. Many's the happy hour I've spent in your main jail. Delightful place. <laughs> Referred to in the trade as the Gray Bar Hotel, you know. Now, what was the charge? I believe that's referred to in the trade as a 4127-ALAMC. Drunk, huh? Oh, now, if you don't mind, officer, rather you wouldn't put it just that way. It sounds so completely undignified. Completely. What were you doing in that bank? Then I spent a short vacation with the sheriff out in Castaic. Ah, that was a charming resort. 
Look, what are you doing in the bank? Then I spent a short vacation with the sheriff out in Castaic. Ah, that's a charming Why were you in the bank? I've also enjoyed the hospitality of the authorities in San Francisco, Oakland, and in Beaumont. Now you look, Texas. mister, we're not playing a game with you here. You come up with some straight answers and come up with them fast. Sir? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to the best of my ability to answer your questions in the order that you present them. Now, I'm still working on the initial one, you understand? Would you like to know why I spent so much time... Look, you know what we want to know. We want to know why you're in that bank. Very well, then I shall tell you. I have spent all of this time in gathering material for a treatise on the penal colonies in America. All right, Frank, let's go. Yeah, come on, mister. Get on your feet. Oh, here now. Now, listen, I resent this treatment, Lenny. And furthermore, I intend to expose your methods in my forthcoming book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Realize, officer, that I've given you fair warning. You're going to book me again? That's right. Drunk? We'll figure that when we get you downtown. Well, that's all you've got. I didn't really do it. You can't book a man to just think about it. Is that right? I didn't really do it. <laughs> I'll just think about it. What are you talking about? What I was doing in the bank. I'm broke and I'm hungry. I just got into town this morning. I arrived amid the sunshine of glorious California. Broke and hungry. So I ambled around a bit and went into the bank. I thought maybe I'd write a little check. Just enough to tide me over until I decide to accept one of the many offers that have been offered me. You got any money in the bank? Oh, that's a trivial detail. However, in as much as you gentlemen are willing to Accord me the hus- hospitality of the Gray Bar Hotel. I shall accept with a lack of it. That's nice. I'm gratified that you appreciate my position. You got any way of proving you just got in town? Is that necessary? Might be for you. I shall have no trouble in supplying such gratification. Yeah. I have been enjoying the hospitality of the largest state for the past three months. I suffered my connection with them two days. Is that right? It certainly is. I, officer, have been in jail for the past three months. Yeah. In Beaumont. The suspect was taken to the city hall and held for further investigation. Teletypes were sent to the authorities in Texas, and they verified the story that we'd gotten. The suspect was booked in violation of 4127A LAMC. The following morning, Frank and I, along with Captain Didion, briefed the police officers chosen by Chief Brown. We told them the suspect's M.O. We gave each of them copies of the composite drawing that had been made. At 10.30 that morning, the plan was put into operation. It continued through the weekend without results. During that time, we received no new complaints regarding the confidence man. Wednesday, December 8th, Frank and I checked into the office. I want to call Faye. Tell her what time I'll be home. Okay. You want to check the book while you're there? Yeah. I got it. Local Fugitive, Friday. Yeah. Okay, where? Yeah, we know where that is. Right. See you there. Fish left to call Faye later. What do you mean? Suspect. Yeah? He's setting up a mark in a coffee shop out on Hollywood Boulevard right now. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. call had come from one of the undercover people that we'd planted in the banks on Hollywood Boulevard. The policewoman told me that a man answering the description had approached her and offered to sell her some unset diamonds. The suspect had suggested that they have a cup of coffee while he explained the deal to the victim. After they'd reached the coffee shop, the policewoman excused herself and put in the call to us. It took us 18 minutes to drive to Hollywood and Vine Streets and to get to the coffee shop. When we entered the place, we could see the policewoman at one of the rear tables. Frank and I walked back and sat down in the adjoining booth. They'd evidently been talking for several minutes before we got there. You can understand my position. I don't want to have to let them go, but I have no choice. Well, I'm still not sure why you don't tell them yourself. There is some trouble about my passport. The authorities are checking it over. If I try to dispose of the diamonds in the usual channels, there are bound to be questions, questions I can't ask. I'm not sure I want to be mixed up in a thing like this. I've never had any trouble with the law. 
My husband would be pretty angry if he knew about this. But there will be no trouble. None. The reason I decided to even bother you with this is that I have seen you several times in the bank. You look to me like a person who would understand and want to help. Oh, that's very kind. It is you who are being kind. To even let me talk to you. I wish I could tell you how much it means to me to be able to walk up to just anyone on the street and talk. To know that there is nothing to be afraid of. This business about the passport is annoying, but it will all be straightened out. After that, everything will be all right. Well, can't you wait until then to sell the diamonds? I'm afraid not. I have bills. I must pay my attorney. My family, they must be taken care of. I need the money now. Well, I'm still not sure. Kind lady, let me show you the gems. Just let me show them to you and then decide. Yes, sir? Coffee, please. Yeah, coffee. Two coffees right away. There. Just look at them. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful in your life? They are nice. These are all we were able to get out of the country. Weeks before we left, we sold everything we owned to buy them. You know, in Europe, diamonds are about the only thing that has a set value. If I were to tell you the trouble we had in getting them, but that would take too long, and I have already taken too much of your time. Not at all. Uh, how much are you asking for them? On the market, they are worth, in American dollars, at least $10,000. Well, I could never pay that much for them. But you would not have to. I don't understand. It is simple. You take them to any jeweler in the city, anyone at all. You pick him up, take the diamonds to him, ask him what they are worth. Then come back to me, and we can make the transaction. You see what he will offer you for them. You will see that what I have said is the truth. You can buy them for me. I will get the money I need. Then you can sell them to the same jeweler and make a handsome profit. Go ahead, take them. I will wait for you here. You'll trust me with them? <laughs> Certainly. I knew when I saw you in the bank I could depend on you. I trust you with my life savings. All right, let's go. Yeah. Something I can do for you, gentlemen? Police officers, you're under arrest. On what charge? Grand theft. You must be joking. Afraid not. Let's go. You get everything you needed, Sergeant Friday? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. You are in with them. I'm a police officer, too. How are you going to know? I'll take the diamonds. You want to give us the Zircons, too? Yeah. Here you are. It's a lousy deal. You're going to have to prove it, you know. We'll take care of that. How are you going to do it? Well, it shouldn't be too tough. Have the victims take a look at you. They should give us a positive identification, shouldn't they? Yeah, I guess so. Where'd you get the stones? Picked them up in New York. They're real, worth easy thirteen, maybe fourteen thousand dollars. How about the imitations? What about? Well, where'd you get them? Friend of mine, guy back east, his hobby is life, you know. Lapidary? Yeah, that's it. I had him cut the zircons for him. Do you know why you wanted them? No, I told him it was for a joke, asking to make me six sets. All of them like the real ones. I only had this one and one more to get rid of. Just two more, and you have to tag me. Yeah, rough go. You need me for any more, Sergeant? No, thanks, Margaret. We'll take him in. Yeah, I'll go on then. Right. Thanks again. Glad to help. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, I'll see you downtown. All right. Tell Chief Brown we'll be in the same, will you? Okay. All right, mister, let's go. Mind if I finish my coffee? All right, make it fast. Okay, thanks. What's your name? Nathan Croner. You ever fallen before? A couple of times, small beast. Where? Midwest, Colorado, Kansas. Big time? Burglary. Served three years in Colorado, too, in Kansas. Thought you had a figure this time. Sure way to make it pay. Never know, do you? What's that? How it's going to turn out. Take his dodge, for instance. Yeah. Hey, you got a cigarette? Yeah, there you go. Here. Thanks. I got a match. You know, this would never work if you tried it with honest people. Is that right? Sure. Right off, I told him I was having trouble with my passport. Even told one of them I was in the country illegally. That's when he should have gone to the cops right then. Mm-hmm. Gonna miss that. What's that? The coffee. Gonna miss it. Anyway, if every one of them didn't have a little thievery in them, isn't a con game in the world it'd work. You ever think of that? Yeah, once in a while. I hand over a bunch of diamonds. Now, I know they're worth a minimum of $15,000. Worth that anywhere in the country. Uh-huh. So what happens? The mark takes them into a jeweler and finds out they're worth that much, and right away he's out to try to make a fast buck for himself. He comes back, tells me they're only good for 10000 You see? Thieves. Mm-hmm. You about finished with that coffee? Yeah. Now, the mark stands to make himself a couple of thousand dollars going in, but that isn't enough. He's going to take me for more. It wouldn't work if they weren't thieves at heart. Well, that still doesn't give you the right to take them. I suppose not. I get a real kick, though, out of figuring what they look like when they find out they're stuck with a handful of cut glass. Must be real yaks to see that look. Oh, now, how about that coffee? Come on, let's go. Yep. Okay, I'm with you. All right. You pull this Dodge any place else in the country? Not me. It's the first place. Figured if I scored good here, I could take it easy. You know, work a bit, maybe once a year in a different city. Keep moving. 
Don't make any difference how they talk or what kind of clothes they wear. A mark's still a mark. I just had a bad deal. It's going good. I could have lived off of it for years. That's what you wanted, huh? Yeah, just a deal to keep me in clothes and food. Roof over my head, nothing big. Well, it all worked out then, didn't it? What? That's what you're going to get. Come on. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 15th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Nathan Austin Croner was tried and found guilty on four counts of grand theft and received punishment as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not more than one year in the county jail or for a period of not less than one nor more than ten years in the state penitentiary. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Sergeant, you're assigned a homicide detail. The body of an attractive woman has been found in the downtown office building, beaten to death with a piece of lead pipe. The killer has escaped into the city. Your job, find him. It was Thursday, April 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. We just left the murder room, and it was 7.40 a.m. when we got to suite 718, the building manager's office. <laughs> Miss Joyce? Yes. Are you men cops? Yes, ma'am. We understand you're the one who found the body. Is that right? Oh, that's right. I found her. Oh, it was an awful thing. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I wonder if you'd feel up to telling us exactly what happened. Oh, sure, yes. It's about the most terrible thing ever happened to There's me. There's something we can get you, ma'am. Oh, no, thanks. Janie brought me some hot coffee. Who's Janie? Janie Alquist. She works the first three floors. She brought me some hot coffee. I see. She was up here, and they let her bring it. All right, Miss Joyce. Could you just tell us about it, please? Well, right from the beginning. You want to hear all about the whole thing? If you would, please. Well, I came on at four, just like always. I punched in and came up to the tenth floor and started in. Got the things out of the closet on the 10th. Mm-hmm. Usually I start on the 7th. But now and then I like to do it a little different, and I start on 10 and work down. Yes, ma'am. What time was it when you found the body? Oh, just a few minutes ago. I guess about 7, right around in there. I only had two more offices to do, and I'd be finished. I just had two more when I got there. Yes, ma'am. If you'd go ahead and tell us about finding the body. Oh, well, I unlocked the door... And I saw the light inside. I thought it was kind of funny, because usually it's dark. You mean in the office? Yes, and where Mrs. Fitzgerald's desk is, it's usually dark. Yes, ma'am. I thought it was kind of funny, like I said. 
But then I thought that maybe she was working. She does accounting, you know, woman accountant, and I thought she was working. Mm -hmm. So I knocked. I didn't just want to go right in if she was working, you know, disturb her. So I knocked. Mm -hmm. But she didn't answer. All right, go ahead, please. Well, I opened the door and went in. Right off, I was kind of sore about it. No excuse for a thing like that. No excuse at all. What do you mean? Well, didn't you see the place? Didn't you look? Yeah. Well, then you know what a mess it was. Papers all over the floor and ashtrays spilled, all that mess, and I'm supposed to be through at 7.30. Why, I'd never have made it. Never got through on time. And that's when I saw her behind the desk. Oh, it was an awful thing. There she was on the floor, dead. Yes, ma'am. There was no one else in the office? No. Just Mrs. Fitzgerald. She was on the floor behind the desk. And what'd you do then? Oh, I screamed. Loud, as loud as I could. I wanted somebody to come up there right away. And that was the first time I ever saw anybody dead. Then I ran out of the office and went downstairs to get somebody to help. Just an awful thing. Oh, poor Mrs. Fitzgerald. Oh, she was so nice. All the time saying hello when she'd come in early and I'd still be working. Oh, I think about it and I just can't believe that it's true. I just can't hardly believe it. Did you see anyone on the floor while you were working? Just Mrs. Fitzgerald. No, ma'am. I mean, was there anybody in the halls of the building? Oh, no. No, not that I saw. There wasn't anybody. I'd have seen them if they was there, but they weren't. All right, Miss Joyce. We'll contact you tomorrow about a statement. Meantime... I'll leave you one of our cards here. If you think of anything we should know, we'd appreciate it if you give us a call. Oh, I sure will. Anything at all I think of, I'll call you. Mm-hmm. Here I go now. Yes, ma'am. I've got to go home and take a hot bath and calm my nerves. Surely. Oh, it sure is going to be a shock to her husband. Of course, not that he'll mind too much. I beg your pardon? Her husband, you know, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes, ma'am. What about him? Well, just that it isn't going to bother that one too much. Why do you say that? Oh, I shouldn't have said anything. Not a word. I shouldn't have told you. I'd get fired, sure. Well, if it's got anything to do with Miss Fitzgerald's death, maybe you better tell us, don't you think? Well, if you'll promise not to tell a supervisor. All right, go ahead. It gets dull just being in a big building by yourself, all alone at night when there isn't anybody around. It's pretty dull. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, not real often, but just once in a while, I kind of... Read some of the letters that people throw away, you know, in the wastebasket. They don't want them anymore, so when it gets real dull, I read them. And I've read some in Mrs. Fitzgerald's office from her husband, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yeah. Seems like they've been having some kind of a big fight, going to court and all. I don't know what it's all about, but they've been fighting. And in the letters, he tells how she ought to leave him alone. I guess she's asking for a lot of alimony or something. That's what it sounded like to me. Some of the letters, the way he wrote to her, mean, used to threaten her all the time. You saw these letters where he threatened her, did you? Yes. One, I guess it was about a week ago, he said in that if she tried to railroad the thing through, now that's what he said, railroad the thing through, he'd come up here and... Yes, go ahead. Well, that's all there is. I couldn't find the other piece of the letter where he said what he was going to do. See, she tore up the letters after she read them. All right, Miss Joyce, thank you very much. No, I hope I helped. Yes, ma'am, I certainly have. I sure wish I could have found that other piece of the letter. No way of knowing what it said. Yes, ma'am. You suppose he really meant it? I don't know. We'll ask him. By the time Frank and I had arrived at the scene, the crew from the crime lab was there. Photographs of the entire room were taken, and fingerprints were lifted from the edges of the desk, from the top of a lamp, and from the molding around the door. The murder weapon, a 15-inch section of heavy lead pipe, was booked for evidence. There was nothing we could tell from the pipe itself other than the fact that it was the murder instrument. It was a plain piece of three-quarter-inch pipe. One end was wrapped in a heavy brown paper. The other was blood-stained. Because of the appearance of the office, it looked as if robbery was the motive for the crime. However, on examination of the victim's personal effects, we found that two large diamond rings were still on her fingers. In her purse, we found cash in the amount of $226. On the desk itself, we found a woman's wristwatch set with 12 diamonds. The fact that none of this had been removed apparently ruled out robbery as the motive. 
The other employees of the building were questioned, but they were unable to shed any light on a possible suspect. None of them had seen any unauthorized persons in the place after closing hours. People on the street in the immediate vicinity were questioned. The only lead we were able to come up with was that at approximately 7.02 a.m., a newsboy had seen a short, stocky man walk from the office building entrance. Other than the brief description of the man's build, the witness was unable to tell us anything. An immediate broadcast was gotten out on what information we had. From a telephone book in the victim's desk, we got an address for her husband, Oscar Fitzgerald. It was a men's club located in downtown Los Angeles. Frank and I drove over to talk to him. Come in. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sit down. I'll call for some coffee. You fellas want some? No, no thanks. No, sir. You don't mind if I have some? No, you go right ahead. Room service, please. Kind of early for the cops to come calling, isn't it? Yes, sir. I guess it is. Uh, this is Mr. Fitzgerald, room 417. Would you please send up a pot of coffee? That's right. Oh, and uh, send a large glass of orange juice, too, huh? Yeah, make sure it's cold. 417. Right. One thing I can't go is warm orange juice. Like a cigarette? Yeah, thank you. Now, what's this all about? What do you want to see me for? Well, when's the last time you saw your wife? Ada? Thank you. I guess a couple weeks ago. Why? Well, can you narrow that down to a day? Why, any special reason for me to? Well, we'd like to hear it. Well, let's see. I guess it was around March 30th. I can check it if it's important. Where'd you see her? At my lawyers. We had a conference to try and work out the divorce and settlement. What line of work are you in, Fitzgerald? I think you'd better tell me what this is all about before I answer any more questions. If this is some sort of trick Ada's trying, you tell her it won't work and she can get off my back. No, it's no trick. I think it might be better if you'd cooperate with us and answer the question. All right, but I'm going to tell you going in that if you try to pull a fast one, I'm going to deny everything I tell you now. If you tell us the truth, you won't have any trouble. Now, where do you work? Right now, I'm between. Well, what's that mean exactly? Well, I'm an actor right now. I haven't gotten a sign. Where'd you work last? Picture studio. Look, until you tell me what this is for, I'm not going to give you any names. Can you give us your movements for the past few days? Starting when? Well, let's try the day before yesterday. Okay, I got up and went out to see my agent. Of course, that was a waste of time. Hung around the office for a couple hours and then had lunch on the strip. After that, I came downtown, saw a movie. I came home, took a shower, and I kept the dinner engaged. You prove that? If I have to, yeah. But you're getting no names until I know what's going on. All right, how about yesterday? What'd you do then? I got up and went out to my agent's. He told me he had a part on the fire. We went out on an interview. I was at the studio until about 4.30, and then we went back to my agent's office and had a couple of drinks. After that, I came back here. It didn't feel too good, and I went to bed. Well, the man at the desk would be able to verify all that, would he? Yeah, just ask him. Fitzgerald, how'd you get along with your wife? Well, it's not any of your business, but I'll tell you. It isn't any secret. I hated everything about it. You ever have any fights with her? Not more than five a week for the past four years. You ever hit her? You know, people win money for answering questions on quiz shows. What happens if I answer the big one? Well, that depends on how you're going to answer it. We understand you wrote your wife some threatening letters now, is that right? I guess you could call them that, yeah. I told her to get off my back and leave me alone. Told her if she didn't, she was building more trouble than she could handle. Did you ever threaten her life? No. I'm not going to try to tell you that there weren't times when I could have killed Ada. There were a lot of them, but it wasn't worth it, not for her. What'd you argue about, mostly? The divorce. I've been trying to get one for the last four years. Ada wouldn't see it. Finally, when I did talk her into it, the settlement she wanted was way out of line. I wouldn't go for it and told her so. What's all this about the fights and the threatening, anyway? Something happened to Ada, is that it? Yes, sir. She been hurt? I'm afraid it's more serious than that. She dead? Yes, sir. You think I did? No, we're checking everybody that knew her. Okay, I told her there were times when I could have, when I maybe wanted to, but I wouldn't go to jail for her. Not ever. You gotta find another boy, and when you do, I'll go as lawyer speak. Yeah. How'd they do it? Piece of lead pipe. Bad? Yeah. Rough way to go. Is there an easy way? We made a preliminary search of the room, but we found nothing that would tie in the victim's husband, Oscar Fitzgerald, with the crime. We talked to the desk clerk, and he verified the man's story that he'd been in his apartment the evening of the killing. Fitzgerald made arrangements with us to attend the coroner's inquest, and Frank and I went back to the city hall. We checked with the crime lab on their investigation. Lieutenant Lee Jones told us that they'd been able to lift several partial fingerprints from the murder weapon, but that they were impossible to classify. He went on to say that the other prints that had been found at the scene were unusable as evidence, since it would be difficult to get enough points for identification. The other physical evidence taken from the office was of little use. A check had been made of the piece of pipe, but it was found to be of a common type and impossible to trace. Microphotographs had been made of the serrated edges, and these had been booked as evidence. We asked the stats office to make a run on the M.O. of the crime, and they told us that they would start through their files immediately. 
For the next two days, Frank and I talked to all of the friends and relatives of the victim, attempting to find a motive for the crime. From what we had to work on, the only plausible reason for the killing was either revenge or jealousy. None of Mrs. Fitzgerald's friends or business acquaintances were able to point out anyone with a strong enough reason to kill the woman. Monday, April 19th, Frank and I got back to the office after interviewing one of the victim's business competitors. Well, that's another one that didn't go any place. Yeah, it seems like that's all we've been drawing on this one, doesn't it? Yeah. I'll check the book. All right. Anything come in from the stats office yet? No. Said they'd have the rest of the run for us this afternoon. Well, first punch didn't turn anything. I got it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah, Jack. Anything on him? Sure. Well, we're no place now. Well, well no, anything's got to be... You want to give me that address? All right. All right, we'll check it. Good. All right, Jack. Thanks again. Bye. It was Jack McCready. Says he talked to one of his informants this morning. Guy came up with a couple of good things, maybe. Yeah? One of them's about a guy in the Olympia Bar at 4th and Kohler. A fellow's pretty drunk. Been doing a lot of talking down there. Something for us? Maybe. He's bragging about beating a woman to death with a piece of pipe. <laughs> p.m. We left the office and drove over to the corner of 4th and Kohler, the Olympia Bar. When we walked in, there were only a few customers in the place. At the far end of the bar, a short, stocky man was sitting alone. In front of him was an empty shot glass and a bottle of beer. He appeared to be pretty drunk, and as we entered, he was talking to the other people seated at the bar. Any of you guys that don't believe it, you just come outside with me, I'll show you. I'll show you all, every one of you. Bartender, I got an empty glass. Now, let's do something about it, huh? I need a drink. I think you had about enough of that, don't you? What? I said you had enough to drink. Who are you to tell me that, huh? Who are you to come in here and tell me what to do? What's the matter? You think you're cops or something, huh? Is that what you think? You called it. Come on, we want to talk to you. You mean you are cops? That's right. Well, listen, you better get out of here and do it fast if you know what's good for you. You just better. Frank, yeah. Take your hands off me. You guys don't hear good, do you? Stand still. You come messing around with me, you're going to find out. You'll find out good. I'll give you the same thing I gave her, the same thing. Hold it, Frank. All right, come on, mister. Who are you talking about? I'll tell you who. I'll tell you good. And you'll know, leave me alone if you know what's good for you. I'm talking about that Ada Fitzgerald, that's who. Ada. You go messing with me and you'll get what she got. I'm a pretty rough fella, you know. Pretty rough. Is that right? You bet you. You're not dealing with a kid, you know. Well, that makes it even then, doesn't it? Huh? You're not dealing with a woman. We took the suspect down to the homicide squad room. He identified himself as Carl Neely. He was handcuffed to a chair, and we ran his name through the record bureau. He had a long string of arrests for various charges, including attempted robbery, assault, and assault with intent to do great bodily harm. He'd never been convicted on a felony, but his record showed that he'd served two terms in the county jail for drunk charges and creating a public nuisance. While we were checking his record, the suspect passed out in an alcoholic stupor in the squad room. We contacted Sergeant Jack McCready and Officer Danny Galindo and asked them to make a search of the suspect's residence. In going over the place, they'd found a blood-stained shirt and a coat. The garments were packed in a cardboard box that had been hidden under the kitchen sink. They were brought downtown to us along with an empty envelope found in the apartment. It had been sent to the suspect, Neely, and the return address on the back indicated that the letter had been sent by the victim's husband, Oscar Fitzgerald. We waited for the suspect to come to enough for us to question him. Frank went out and brought back some hot coffee. We tried to get Neely to drink some of it. 8.40 p.m. <coughs> it's not hot. All right, come on, try some more. <coughs> You're cops, huh? You've been the route before. Yeah. What am I here for? I want to talk to you about the Fitzgerald woman. Ada? Mm, spouting off again. You said you killed her. Figures. Every time I get tanked up, I've always killed somebody. Whatever it fails. All right, tell us about the Fitzgerald woman. <sighs> Nothing to tell. I read about it in the papers. This morning I started drinking. It always happens when I've been belting the booze. I right away tell people I killed somebody. These clothes here belong to you? Let me see. I don't know. Where'd you get them? Are they yours? I don't know. You got that many clothes? Hmm? I know all the clothes I got. No trouble at all. 
Maybe you don't dress as good as me. All right, come off it, Neely. You're in trouble. Big trouble here. You sat in the bar this morning, told everybody about how you'd beaten a woman to death. We find these clothes in your apartment, blood stains all over them. Here's another thing, this envelope. Where'd you get this? Through the mail, like it says. You see the stamp? You know Oscar Fitzgerald? I don't get mail from strangers. Sure, I know him. Is it a crime to get a letter now? What was in that envelope? I don't think that's none of your business. Well, we do. What kind of dealings have you got with Oscar Fitzgerald? Well, you still work for him? Doing what? I took care of the place when him and Ada were married. Sort of a general handyman. When would you see him last? I don't know. Maybe a couple of months ago, around there. A couple, three months. Well, what did he find so important that he wrote you about it? Look, he loaned me some money. He sent me a check. It was a loan, huh? Yeah. Sign any sort of note for the money? Well, I endorsed the check. It said on it I was a loan. What are you guys trying to prove, anyway? You trying to tie me in with Ada's killing? You look good for it. You're off your rocker. I had nothing to do with it. Sure, you got me for drunk, but that's all. Your record makes you look good for it. The clothes we found in your apartment don't help you. You sure Oscar Fitzgerald didn't pay you to kill his wife? It'd be a lot better if you told us the truth here, Neil. I'm telling you the truth. It's right in front of you. All you got to do is open your eyes. It's there. Where'd the bloodstains come from? They're mine. Well, tell us about it. Well, I got in a fight with another fella. Where? A bar down on 7th. When? Wednesday. Last week? Yeah, last Wednesday. What time did you have this fight? Closing time? That'd make it about 2 o'clock, huh? That's when the bar's closed. Where'd you go after you had the fight? Went up to a friend's house and had a couple more drinks. Who's a friend? You don't know him. He's got no record. What's his name? I don't want him dragged into anything. What's his name? Jackie Meadows. Let me see your hands, Neely. Here. You got some pretty bad bruises there. You must have hit something pretty hard. The fight I told you about, that's where those came from. Tell us what you did after you left the bar. I told you, I went up to Jackie's. I had a couple of drinks. What time did you get there? Around 3, maybe 3.10. What time did you leave? About 5. Where'd you go? I don't remember too good. I was pretty boozed up. Where do you think you went? Well, Jackie was worried about me being cut up from the fight. He wanted me to see a doctor. Yeah. He drove me down to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Yeah. I was there until 9.30 Thursday morning. <laughs> Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, asking if a patient was given emergency treatment on the morning of Thursday, April 15th. A search of the hospital records verified the story told to us by the suspect, Carl Neely. We checked through our crime reports, and we found that a miscellaneous injury report had been made. From the coroner's report, we knew that the victim had been murdered between the hours of 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. on that morning. We got in touch with Neely's friend, Jackie Meadows, and he also verified the suspect's story. He was booked in at the main jail on a charge of being drunk in a public place, and Frank and I started checking out the remainder of the list that the stats office had given us. Originally, there had been 12 names on the list. We talked to 10 of them. The 11th, a Norman Sitkin, had a record of burglary, attempted robbery, and assault with a deadly weapon. He'd been arrested and brought to trial on a charge of murder three years previously, but he'd been acquitted. The circumstances surrounding his arrest were the same as those in the Fitzgerald case. The main reason he'd been released a free man was the testimony of his mother, who had sworn that Sitkin had been home with her on the night of the killing. When we went out to his home, we found that he wasn't there. We talked to his mother, and she told us that he'd been in San Diego for the past three days. Under interrogation, we established the fact that on the night of the Fitzgerald killing, Sitkin hadn't been at home, but that he had been in Los Angeles. We put in a call to the San Diego authorities and talked to Lieutenant Mort Gear in the homicide detail. We contacted the hotel where he was staying in Los Angeles, and a 24-hour stakeout was placed on the location. Wednesday, April 21st, Frank and I got back from lunch. Better put in a call to Mort, huh? See if they got anything on Sitkin? Yeah. You want to do it? Right. Okay. Hi, this is Frank Smith, robbery. Yeah, I'd like to put in a call to San Diego PD Homicide Bureau. Yeah, Lieutenant Mort Gear. No, it's a homicide. Yeah, DR-132-549. Yeah, that's one. Mm-hmm. That's 3268. Huh? Well, 58. Right. Okay, Sam, thanks. I'm on this one, Joe. Oh, sorry. Homicide, Friday. Yes, sir? No, that's right. When was that? Yes, sir. Right away. Cancel that call, Frank. What do you got? Sitkin just walked into his hotel. (laughs) 
Frank and I left the office immediately and drove out to Sitkin's hotel. We talked to the officers on stakeout, and they told us that the suspect had just returned. They went on to explain that they'd given Sitkin no reason to suspect that anything was wrong and that he'd gone directly to his room. Frank and I got in the elevator, and we went up to the fourth floor. Yeah? What do you want? You Norman Sitkin? Yeah, what do you want? Police officer. Come on! You got no right to do this. Let me see your warrant. Get your coat, Sitkin. We want to talk to you. What for? What do you got to talk to me about? I got nothing to say. Get your coat. Why? What's the charge? What are you taking me in for? Suspicion of murder? You're kidding. Well, you just keep thinking that. You mean this is for real? Come on, let's go. Well, now, wait a minute. I want to know what this is all about. Is that so? Well, sure. Figure I had something to do with that woman who was beaten to death downtown. Fitzgerald, I think that's the name, huh? Isn't that what you think? Well, you seem to know all about it. Well, you're way off on this one. I got an alibi that you can't break. I can see you guys figuring because I stood this kind of beef once before, you can make it stick this time. Well, it won't work, cop. None of it fits together. I can prove where I was that night, every minute. All right. That's right, every minute. You check in my house. Happens I was with my mother, just like the other time. All night I was home. You're going to stand on that? Well, there isn't any other way. Well, it's going to make it a lot easier then. Well, what's that supposed to mean? We've talked to your mother. She says you weren't home that night. Well, she's wrong. You let me talk to her. She'll tell you. You just let me talk to her. She's sure you weren't there. She's willing to testify to that. Get out of my way! All right, come on. Let me get the cuffs. Yeah. Hold still. Funny, isn't it? What's that? Well, it looks like he might have been good on that first killing. The one he was acquitted on. His mother might have lied on the stand. That's not going to make a lot of difference, is it? Huh? He's going to make up for it on this one. <laughs> Norman Edward Sitkin was tried and convicted for murder in the first degree. On recommendation of the jury, he received the maximum penalty, and on July 19th, he was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. told her I'd go right along with you. Well, that won't be necessary. Now, listen, young man. If there's anything wrong with them kids, I want to know about it. I want to do my part. The whole neighborhood's talking. Is that right? Sure. Little Stevie's been to all the houses looking for something to do, asking for work. It just seems to me that there's something wrong about the whole caboodle of them. Not seeing the mother and the way the boy don't eat the lunch plate. Not seeing the other kids. There's something that don't fit over there. All right, ma'am. We'll look right into it. You just do that. We'll see what I say is true. Thank you, Mrs. Eggers. Don't go thanking me. Just trying to be civil-minded, that's all. Mm-hmm. Just seems that there isn't anybody who cares about those kids. Well, that's not true, Mrs. Eggers. What? We do. 8.14 p.m. Policewoman Irene Gardner and I left the office and drove over to the address the Eggers woman had given us. The house was a small, one-story, clabbered building located on the rear of the lot. The front yard was overgrown with weeds and there were neighborhood advertising papers lying around. When we arrived, there was a faint light on in one of the front rooms. Irene and I went up to the front door and we knocked. We got no answer. I tried the door, but we found it locked. There was no sound from inside the place. The shades were drawn over the windows so that it was impossible for us to see into the house. We walked around to the rear and tried the back door. It's locked. Yeah, doesn't look like there's anybody home. Uh-huh. Well, let's talk to that Eggers woman again, huh? All right. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? From the story she gave us, the kid should be at home. 
she might be seeing things, Joe. You know, trying to figure out some way to get attention. Yeah, might be. Didn't seem like that to me, though. Joe? What? What do you got there? The front window. There, you see it? Yeah. There's somebody in there. Come on, let's go. Try it again. Yeah. Not answering. Come on, open up in there. We know you're in there. Come on. Open the door. What do you want? Police officers, let us in. There's nothing wrong. Go away. No, we can't do that. Now, come on, open up. Who are you going to arrest? Nobody. We just want to talk to you. You sure that's all? That's right. Okay. Just a minute. What do you want? Are you Pamela Telford? I haven't done anything wrong. Well, we didn't say you did. Then what are you doing around here? What are you looking for? Is your mother in? What? Is your mother home? Well, yeah, she's here. Well, we'd like to see her if it's all right. You can't. You can't see her. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to. She's lying down, asleep. That's why you can't talk to her. Well, what's the... well, what did she say when she left? Just like always. She said she wasn't feeling very good and she was going out and trying to look for work. What kind of work does she do? Well, she's a waitress. A good one, too. Mm-hmm. That's a trouble, I guess. She's so good. What do you mean? Well, there are only a couple of places that Mom says are any good. Well, you know, where she went to work. I don't believe I understand what you mean, Steve. Well, Mom always said that she wasn't just a hash slinger. That's what she called it. Oh, I see. She said that she was a waitress and she couldn't go to work just any place. Mm-hmm. Where'd she work last? A big place out in Beverly Hills. Forgot the name right now. How long did your mother work there? Well, she, she had some trouble, and she had to quit. Well, what do you mean, trouble? Well, she got sick, and the man who was her boss got mad at her. And I guess he said a lot of things her mom didn't like. So mom told him that he couldn't talk to her like that, and then she quit. Your mother ever tell you what was wrong with her? See? No, she didn't. Did you see a doctor about it? You might as well know it. You're going to find out anyway. What's that, son? Her mom drank a lot. Sometimes she'd drink too much and then she'd get sick. That's what was wrong. Mm-hmm. Where's your father, Steve? He died before Carol was born. Right before. I want you to take a look at a picture for us, will you? Look at it and tell us if you know who the man in it is. All right. There you are. That's Mom. Mm-hmm. You know who the man is? No. I don't think I ever saw him before. Does your mother have any men friends? No, I don't think so. At least she never told me about him. She always said that the kids were enough for her, that we were all that mattered. She used to say that when she got a steady job, we were all going to live good. She used to tell us how one day the phone would ring and all our troubles would be over. Just like that. One day we've had a little trouble and the next, everything was going to be all right. Mm-hmm. Well, she really believed it, too. Just all of a sudden, the phone was going to ring and all our troubles would be over. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to tell her. Tell her what, son? That they turned the phone off. We had the name Rowena Telford checked through R&I. We found that the boy's story was true. The woman had been arrested once on a charge of 4127A LAMC, being drunk in a public place. Irene put in a call to the waitress's union and asked them to check to see if the woman was working any place in town. They came back with the information that the last job she'd held had been six months before and that she'd been fired for insubordination and for being drunk. We showed the picture of the man and woman that we'd found at the Telford home around the department in the hopes that one of the officers might recognize the place where it was taken. None of them did. The next morning, we had several copies made, and we began a search of the bars along 5th Street. We asked each bartender if he'd ever seen the man or the woman. In the first four places we checked, we got yes answers to the query about the woman, but none of the people we talked to could tell us anything about the man in the picture. What's the matter, little girl? Nothing. Why'd you ask something like that? Don't you think you better let us in? We're going to have to talk to your mother. But she's asleep. She's tired. You can't talk to her. You can't. Ah, come on. You want to go in and wake her up? There's some things we've got to talk to her about. I wonder if we could come in. It's kind of wet out here. Hmm? How about it? And then you can get your mother and we can have our talk, huh? I guess you can come in. I guess it's all right. Come on in, Joe. Yeah. The front room was about 12 feet square. The only light in the room came from a candle and a jelly glass on a table. 
The only furniture in the place was the table that held the candle and a torn artificial leather and chrome couch. The floor was covered with paper, rain-soaked cardboard boxes, and dirty clothes. At a half a dozen different places, drops of dirty water were seeping through the roof. The water was being caught in empty tin cans that had been placed around the room. To the left was a door to a bedroom. In it, in a wooden crib, were two children. From the descriptions we'd gotten from the Eggers woman, we recognized them as Martin Telford, age four, and his sister Carol, age two. As soon as the children saw Irene and me, they hid their heads under the dirty blanket that covered the crib. There was nothing else in the room except a dirty mattress lying on the floor in one corner. From the appearance of the bedding, it hadn't been laundered or changed in at least three weeks. On the other side of the house, a small kitchen was piled high with dirty dishes, pieces of rotting food, and empty tin cans. The plumbing in the house had apparently been out of order for several weeks. While Irene and I looked over the house, the girl who'd met us at the door, Pamela Telford, followed us. When we got back to the front room, she started to cry. All right, you want to tell us where she is? Come on, Pamela. It's not as bad as all that, is it? Here, here's a handkerchief. Here you are. Now, where's your mother? She's out looking for a job. It's kind of late for that, isn't it? I don't know. That's what she's doing, though. Out looking for a job. Well, now, why'd you tell us that she was here tonight? Because I didn't know what you wanted. I thought you were trying to arrest her. Well, why'd you think that? Because that's what she said. Your mother said that? Yes. She told us that policemen arrested people. She told us about it, how you did it once to her. Your mother's been arrested? Yes. Do you know why? Because she was. Well, what for, do you know? She got sick. She got sick and they put her in jail. Mm -hmm. That's why I told you she was asleep. I thought that you'd go away and leave us alone. It's sure cold in here. Yeah. Do you have any heat in the house, Pamela? There's a heater in the bedroom. I'll turn it on. It doesn't work. What? The heater doesn't work. Marty was playing one day and he broke the little rods in it. It doesn't work anymore. Well, we should be able to get some heat out of it. No, you won't. There isn't any gas. They turned it... Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned a juvenile detail. Four children in your city have apparently been abandoned by their mother. There's no trace of the woman's whereabouts. There's a possibility of foul play. Your job, investigate. It was Friday, February 8th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from Juvenile Hall, and it was 7.46 p.m. when I got to 1335 Georgia Street, the office. Joe? Yeah, Irene? You talked to Captain Powers? Yeah, the way it looks, Frank's going to be tied up in court for a couple of days. It's going kind of hard. Gang war, isn't it? Yeah, seems like everybody in town's climbed on this one, really making a big thing out of it. Uh-huh. Fellow Skipper said I was supposed to give you a hand on anything that might come up. Then you just made it. Hmm? Woman in the next office, you better talk to her. What's it about? It'll be better if you got it straight from her. Was she a crank? I don't think so. See what you can figure. All right. Mrs. Eggers? Yes, Miss Gardner. You ready to do something about this? Yes, ma'am. I'd like you to meet Sergeant Friday. Joe, this is Mrs. Eggers. Now, how do you do? Miss Eggers? If you'd give him the story the way you told it to me. You bet I will. Sit down, young man. I'll tell you all about it. All right. Get your book out. I beg your pardon? Your book. You're going to take some notations, aren't you? Well, if you'll just tell us what this is all about. Yeah. Well, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. I'm not. It's just that I take an interest in the things that go on around me. civil minded the way they put it in the papers. Uh-huh. Of course, there are people who say that I pay too much mind to their business, but it isn't true. Not a bit of it. If you tell the sergeant what happened. Oh, yeah. Well, these people moved into the house about six months ago, the five of them. Yes, ma'am. Stevie, Pamela, Carol, Martin, and the mother, Rowena. Four kids and the mother. All right. Would you like to go on? Well, now, right off, I could spot this woman. Seen a lot of them. Well, how do you mean that, Miss Eggers? You can make it crystal if it's any easier. Yes, ma'am. What did you mean? That you've seen a lot of them? Alkies, you know. Drunks. Mm-hmm. Well, she's one. I could spot it right off. Her and those four beautiful children. Yeah. 
Well, the first few months they lived there, I'd maybe see her a couple times a week, you know, going in the house or coming out. Just a couple times a week. I see. Last week, ten days, I hadn't seen her at all. Not even a little sight. Mm -hmm. So right off, I figured that something was wrong. That's the way it looks to me. All right, thank you, Miss Eggers. We'll check on the house right away. Well, that's what I wanted this policewoman to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think maybe you youngsters better come downtown with us, don't you think? Why? Well, it'll be warm down there, a lot more comfortable for you. We can't go. we got to wait here. That's all right, Pamela. We'll leave word for your mother where you are. Maybe that's your mother now, huh? No, it's Steve. Who are you? He's a policeman. What do you want? There's nothing wrong here. Nothing for you to come butting in for. We want to see your mother, son. She hasn't done anything. Why don't you cops leave her alone? All the time you're after, never leave her alone. You're kind of rough for a little guy, aren't you? That's none of your business. I know my rights. I know I'm good. Well, look here, son. We're going to take you downtown and give you a good meal, just until we can talk to your mother, that's all. Then you're going to bring us back? Well, we'll see. How about Marty and Carol? You taking them, too? Yeah. Going to give them something to eat? Yes, that's right. Okay, we'll go with you. Just for tonight, though, that's all. Just for tonight. You understand? Yeah. One another thing. Yes, what's that? We're paying our own way. I've got money. Anything you give us, we're going to pay for. Well, you won't have to do that, son. Well, I'm going to. We don't need charity. We're getting along all right. Everybody has a little rough luck now and then. Everybody. Mom tries. She really does. She's been looking for a job for a long time. Uh-huh. All right, Steve, you want to help get the others ready to leave? I'm not sure we can go. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to, son. All right, but just for tonight. But the only reason is that I want Marty and Carol and Pamela to have something hot to eat. There's something wrong with the stove since we can't cook on it. That's the only reason we're going. Just because there's something wrong with the stove. The gas is turned off. No, it isn't. It just don't work. But whatever we eat, whatever we get, we're going to pay for it. I've got the money. Well, I told you once before that won't be necessary. It is, too. We're not taking any charity. We've never taken any. We're not going to start now, either. Anything that's done for us is going to be paid for. Yeah, I guess that's right, Steve. Huh? It'll be paid for. Eight fifty-six p.m. Men from the crime lab arrived and photographed the entire house. The pictures were held for evidence. A search of the house showed that there was no food for the children. In a cardboard box in the bedroom under a pile of toilet articles, we found a photograph of a man and a woman taken at what appeared to be a beach photographer's. Irene and I checked through the rest of the house, but we found nothing that would indicate where the mother of the four Telford children had gone. The youngsters were taken to juvenile hall, bathed, given clean clothes, and fed. At first, Steve Telford refused to eat anything until he was assured that his two sisters and his brother were being given the same kind of food. After the boy had finished eating, Irene and I talked to him. His previous uncooperative attitude had changed, and he seemed anxious to help us find his mother. This is the longest she's ever been gone. I'm beginning to think there might be something wrong. Well, when did you see her last, Steve? This is Friday, isn't it? Yes, February 8th. Uh-huh. It was last Tuesday, then. You mean this week, son? No, a week ago. A week ago Tuesday. 